What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? This is going to be a much more candid, open, uh, very minimally edited video just because I want you to sense my passion and my earnestness and in, in, in when I say this. Now, basically, as you can tell from the title, not going to be a very apologetic space. It's just going to be something that I want to share um, that's from my heart about something that I've really been discussing with my buddies in, in full detail. I mean, that is this issue of why the church is collapsing. And now, obviously, you could theorize this into so many different things, but really when it comes down to it, you know, my friends and I, I've, I've been blessed to, to hang out with them. Um, we've all just recently connected, um, even though we all went to the same high school, but they just recently became Christians. And so that's been awesome. And uh, we all love uh, Living Waters and Ray Comfort. And we just love seeing him go out and share the gospel. And it's really impacted us and prompted us to, to do the same. And so as we've read more of his things, we've started to notice how much of what he does and much of what's effective is really what is lacking in so much of the church. And so when I say church, I'm not talking about born again believers who are out there, you know, doing their thing for God or what have you, but I'm, I'm more so speaking about the institutional four walls and a roof kind of church where, um, you know, it's all about the routine. It's all about the, the legality of it as opposed to, um, you know, the great commission and, and, and saving sinners by speaking the truth. Ultimately, it's God who does it, but, you know, we're still called to, to, to share it. And so, um, you know, it's just insane because I know that the last thing you want to hear, especially in 2020, is another guy offering another opinion into this, you know, huge ring of those who have tossed their hat in. But this is just something, again, you know, if, you, if a few people see it, awesome. If, you know, no one sees it, hey, at least I got it off my chest. But um, really, my friends and I, Aaron and Chris, and I'll be mentioning them later, too, so keep their, keep their names in mind. We, um, you know, we really just think that so much of what's wrong with the church nowadays is that, and again, even in an individual sense, so much of us have idolized our comfort. So much of us have idolized, you know, our, our pleasure and not stepping out of our comfort zone. And unfortunately that takes on many different forms, but it all has the same kind of result, which is a kind of growing of self and a decrease of Christ. And so what do I mean by this specifically? Well, specifically, what, what about when we look at the gospel Unfortunately, when it comes to the modern day gospel, it's missing a major, major component that ultimately divides what I would say true believers from false converts. And that is this, this issue of repentance. Now, when I, when I say that, many of you are going to automatically think I'm saying that, you know, repentance is kind of cleaning up your life before you come to Christ. And unless you come to, unless you come to Christ clean, there's no point in coming at all. And there are many of you who are going to agree with me and bravo me or whatever, but Ultimately, when I talk about this, what I'm saying is that the Greek word for repentance in the Bible is metanoia, which means to change one's mind. It's not necessarily the actions, but the actions result from the change in mind, just like how in the book of James, the works result from your faith in God, your true faith in God. And so when we give the gospel and we don't preach repentance, we don't preach how, hey, you need to change your mind about God, it doesn't actually lead to in my opinion, what would be a true conversion? Because how can a person truly receive salvation unless they're unless they understand what they're being saved from? And I'm not saying they got to know all their doctrine about hell or what have you, but unless they recognize that, hey, you know, I'm in this different standing before God than I thought I was, how can they stand at all? You know, because many people and many, you know, much of what you hear in the modern day gospel is really just a Jesus that you add to your life. He doesn't replace anything, but he simply is just put on top of everything else. Like there's no change. You know, you've got this lifestyle. You've got this person in your life. You've got these things. Don't really worry about changing any of that too much, but just more so focus on the fact that, hey, you you raised your hand right in church. And so now you're going to heaven. It's like, you know, it's really not that, you know, Jesus replaces many of the things in our lives. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's not easy giving those things up, but he is he, he is the the common denominator that influences all of the decisions that we make. And again, unfortunately, because there's no repentance preached, many never, I don't want to say understand that, but just come to accept that. And so again, you can't preach repentance unless a person sees that, hey, what you thought was between you and God is really not the case at all. You know, you thought that you were, you know, good with God and that, hey, as long as you're a good person, you're going to heaven, right? And that, you know, you just got to raise your hand in church and you're, and you're solid, but that's not the case. You know, you bring them through those 10 commandments and you show how, hey, you're, you're a sinner. 
And because of your sin, you stand condemned before God. Not to, not to create terror in them or make them feel bad about themselves, but to show them that, yes, unless you repent, meaning you change how you thought about it and you change to a different way mentally, you're not going to be able to be saved because you can't truly trust in Christ without repenting. You can't truly trust in what Jesus did for you unless you understand what he did and why he did it. And the reason he did it was because, and left to our own devices, we'd be condemned because of our sin. And unfortunately, many churches don't want to preach that because it requires talking about sin. It requires telling people that, no, you're not a good person. And that is a difficult thing to do in this day and age where everyone wants to hold on to these, you know, preconceived notions about themselves and about the world and what's really true. And it's offensive to tell people that, no, what you're doing here is wrong. But ultimately, if we love people, we'll tell them. Not because, again, we, we take pleasure in seeing them feel bad, but because unless they understand that they have to jump, they're not going to understand why they need to put on a parachute. You know, you hear a lot of, uh, maybe you've seen this quote too. It's, a, it's something I see among a lot of Christians where they say things like, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. And I just, I'm not going to call it a heresy, but I look at stuff like that and it just, it bothers me so much, especially after getting into Ray, because you realize how much damage that can really do to this whole idea of sharing the gospel. So what do I mean by that? The point of the quote is basically just to say how, hey, you know, your actions should supplement, your, your actions should speak louder than your words. And on one hand, that is true. But the issue is that many people read that quote, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary use words. And what they do is they breathe this kind of sigh of relief in the back of their mind where they say, oh, thank goodness, I've been so scared of sharing the gospel. I don't have to do that now. All I have to do is just be a good person and people will come up to me and ask me. You know, and I ask people, you know, in the last year, how many times has that happened? And they'll say like, you know, once or twice. So out of all the people you've interacted with in the last 365 days, it's only happened about once or twice. And then even during those one, one or two times, did you share the gospel? And even then that's up in the air. And so those type of things are good. They're, they're, they're well-intentioned, but they really just take away from the truth of the urgency that we have in sharing the gospel. Not because, you know, I mean, I believe we're in the end times, but not because of that, but just more so because, hey, none of us know if we're going to see tomorrow. The past is gone. Tomorrow isn't promised. All that we have is right now. And so unfortunately, whenever I see stuff like that, it just makes me think, you know, you're, you're basically conditioning Christians to operate only off of their behavior. And now don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean that there's no place for behavior. That doesn't mean that there's no place for, I believe that, I believe that the two go hand in hand. So what do I mean by that? Basically, you should be preaching the gospel. You should be saying the words. I'm not saying you got to be down on a, on a box down in, in downtown or whatever and, you know, shouting from the top of your lungs, but you should be intentional and serious in how you present the gospel to people. You shouldn't shy away from those opportunities. Um, you shouldn't always have to wait until someone else brings it up because it's important enough to where, hey, we can confront people. You know, if you see an 18 wheeler heading for someone, you're going to tell them. You're not going to wait for them to ask you, is there an 18 wheeler heading toward me? But unfortunately, that's the way many Christians act because, again, we idolize that comfort. We don't want to have to we don't want to have to face people with their sin because it can mean rejection. They get angry at us. Who knows? But either way, it's not legitimate enough for us to shy away from speaking the truth to them, especially if we truly believe that they're in danger. But um, unfortunately, yeah, it's just it's just so detrimental because, you know, I, I tell people, I say on the day of Pentecost, when the church began, you know, what did the disciples say after they were speaking all those languages and the huge crowd gathered around them? You know, did they say, oh, you know, let's just behave differently now and hope people ask us why we're different. No, they preach the gospel. But look, when they preach the gospel, their actions supplemented the words that they said, meaning they made people understand what it is they believed and why. And then when people watched them, they saw that they truly believed it, not just intellectually, but personally because they lived it out. And so the two go hand in hand. But it's not enough just to preach the gospel and to not live it out because people will think you're a hypocrite and they'll say, I don't need Christianity. You don't even live it. But at the same time, it's also not enough to uh, simply just try and be a good person and then think that's enough to, to, to share the truth of the gospel with people. It's really not, you know, because there are many people of faith groups that are that are nice people. You know, Mormons are nice. Jehovah's Witnesses are nice. And so being nice is not enough because there's not enough there to interpret who is who. We need to be intentional in what we say and how we present these things so that these people will know not just what we're doing, but ultimately why we're doing it and who we're doing it for. 
perfect example is my buddy Aaron. He was, I mean, you know, I was by no means a super strong Christian in high school, but um, I knew enough in high school to hey, to be like, hey, I don't want to hang out with that guy. I knew enough to know that. And uh, when we started connecting after he became a Christian, he was telling me like, yeah, man, you know, I was just doing my own thing. I was living the way I wanted. And one day my mom, she just, I was taking out the trash and she just, she just asked me, she said, son, you know, have you thought about, you know, where, where you're going to go when you die, heaven or hell? And he was like, he kind of blew it off. He's like, I don't need that. And, you know, blew her off or whatever, but it stuck with him and, and he thought about it. And, and ultimately it led to him accepting Christ. And that's something that I'm sure his mom had been so nice to him before. I'm sure she's a great person. And she had exemplified that to him and his whole family. But ultimately, nothing changed until she was bold enough to actually confront him with the truth. Again, is it scary? Yeah. But that's not enough to then shy away from spreading the truth, especially if we believe it's going to save people from an eternity without God, from hell. And so the reality is that as nice as you want to be, as good of a person as you may want to be, there are just some people that will not be able to decipher those things unless you speak the truth to them. And in fact, we should be speaking the truth to all of them because you don't want to leave any stone unturned. You don't want to leave any room for doubt that these people know what it is you believe and why you believe it, because that's ultimately, if they apply it, what will save them.